All right. So welcome uh, to week six of Game Cool Books on the Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. I'm Wesley Schantz, and I'm joined tonight by Verlin Flieger, um, Tolkien scholar and Signum University professor. Um, so welcome, Verlin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, making the time and, and talking to me here. Um, some of your work uh, is in Interrupted Music and in Splintered Light in a Question of Time. These are books, book-length studies of Tolkien. Um, you've also released uh, selections of your articles and essays and editions of Tolkien's works. Um, so you have really in your career done a great deal for the study of, of Tolkien and you continue to um, on Signum University, which is where I became aware of your work. Um, and I took the class on Tolkien and tradition, um, just auditing it recently uh, and, and learned a lot about areas of his, uh, his interests um, in, in Nordic mythology, in Finnish mythology that I had no idea about. Uh, found it really, really interesting. Now, I, I grew up um, just, just nearby the University of Maryland. Um, and so I would have driven by going over to Washington College uh, back and forth um, when I was at college there. And uh, that's where I met Corey Olson. And uh, he was a teacher of mine there. Uh, but so we just missed, a lot of my friends went to, went to UMD. Yeah. Um, and uh, okay, so I wanted to jump in though um, to your your uh, interest in Pullman because that uh, that's kind of what I'm most curious about as a Tolkien scholar. How did you become aware of Philip Pullman, and uh, and what do you think about him? I think I just saw the book on a shelf in a bookstore, and it looked interesting, uh, and so I bought it. I been a while. I don't think I don't think I'd heard of Philip Pullman. Interesting. Uh, so I guess, to the best of my recollection, I think I just discovered him as a writer of fantasy. All right. And what did you think? Uh, I have mixed feelings about Pullman. I thought the Golden Compass was very, very good. I really, really liked it. I thought he had he had managed very well to create a sort of alternative reality, which was at the same time familiar, uh, but was also a secondary world. Uh -huh. I loved Lyra. Uh, she was great. I thought Mrs. Coulter was a chillingly effective villain, uh, very, very well done, done. I liked the demons. I loved the Egyptians. Oh, yeah. I liked them, um, I don't know, because, partly because of the way they talked, which was a kind of parallel English. Yeah. So I thought The Golden Compass was good. Uh, I read the American edition, not the, mm. not the British Northern Lights. And I was uh, eager to read the second volume, and I found it to be a kind of disappointment. Oh, okay. Say. Tell me what you thought of it. I, well, so I, I grew up with these books, and I, like, like you say, The Golden Compass just uh, enthralled me. Um, but when I came to The Subtle Knife, I was not let down at all. I thought the introduction of this new character was brilliant, and now there was um, a, a kind of opening up of the worlds, right? Not just between Lyra's world and the, and the city and the Northern Lights, but now all of the worlds were connecting, and th this world, like the world that we live in, was, was drawn into the story. Um, I just thought that was so uh, so fascinating. Uh, I I guess reading them now, I'm curious um, to see how they hold up. I suppose because it's been a while since I've uh, read B 
beyond some of the early chapters of the Golden Compass, which are my favorites in the whole the whole series. It's sort of like, oh, yeah, um, particularly um, Lyra's Jordan, that that yes. chapter of where you first kind of meet the Egyptians, uh, you first learn about the gobblers, right? Um, and finally, at the end of the chapter, you learn Mrs. Coulter's name, but uh, but her demon is never named, right? Although that's sort of the emblem for her. Um, but all of those things, I thought, uh, they they do have a kind of different feel to them than some of the later parts of the series. And I wonder what what accounts for that. Um, do you have a sense of what shifts after? The Golden Compass and going into the other books in the series? I felt that um, I, I was disappointed with the second volume because I felt it didn't it didn't live up to the promises hmm. that the first volume had held out. Like the, the Wonderful City. What is it? Is yeah. that a God thing? Uh, the abandoned city in in uh, the second volume, which doesn't look so hot. Yeah. I found that there were. Forgive me, Philip Pullman, and probably somebody can certainly say the same thing about me. But I found careless mistakes in his writing. Uh. Um, in the Golden Compass, Mrs. Coulter takes Lyra under her wing and takes her to live with her and uh, teaches her all kinds of feminine um, procedures and how to wash her hair and how to use perfume. And in uh, the second volume, she doesn't know how to wash her hair. And Will oh. has to tell her. And I thought that was kind of a lapse. Yeah, I never noticed that. Uh, it's just little details like that that made me start to wonder. I never figured out why Will lost two fingers of his hand. Uh, that didn't seem to me to contribute uh -huh. in any way. Uh, so the... I, I could see how the subtle knife worked to cut windows in the worlds. Mm -hmm. But not why <laughs> why it was cutting Will's fingers off. Yeah, that that's sort of the um, the wound uh, that it gives every bearer of the knife, right? Is so how that's explained. Yeah, but, why? but why that should be? Yeah. Well, it makes me think of um, kind of a mythic motif uh, that you see with uh, Baron, one hand, and you see it with Frodo losing his finger. That, that sort of like, that experience marking you, um, that experience of heroism. Um, it recalls mm -hmm. those, those moments in Tolkien. Yeah. Um, but I feel that in Tolkien, they are really sort of integrated into the story. Tolkien yeah. and hands is a big trope. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated with that. Um, but the loss of a hand goes back to Norse mythology. Yeah. That's where Tolkien derived it. And it's that motif that he uses in mm. the Lord of the Rings, particularly, but also in the Silmarillion with the Baron. And I think it's Maglor loses a hand. Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, I know. I know because of but the story no, that they talk about. Yeah. The god Tyr in Norse mythology, in, in Edda, uh, loses his hand to uh -huh. the world. And there's an enormous amount of meaning packed into that. And when Frodo loses his finger to Gollum, it is, um, it is a moment in the same tradition yeah. of sacrifice, of something essential for the greater good. And I didn't feel that with Will. Yeah, fingers. It just seemed gratuitous. That's yeah. That's maybe a good word for it. The the feeling that it's uh, 
gory or um, over, like gross, I think was the word Sparrow might have used when I was talking to her about things that she didn't like about the books. Um, yeah, that they're un unjustified. Uh huh. It was Unjustified. a narrative background to it. Yeah. Did you read, did you end up reading the final volume in the trilogy? Yes, I did, and I thought okay. it was terrible. I thought oh, so. it was awful. Why? It was so agenda-ridden. Ah. Uh, I had the same feeling about it that I did about the Chronicles of Narnia. I felt that I was being preached at. That's, yeah. That's that's very interesting because as a kid, I loved the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, reading them, uh, I I didn't like them as much as The Hobbit, um, and I didn't like them as much as The Golden Compass and those books. But I did like them, and it was only later reading um, Philip Pullman's critiques, which are very savage uh, of of Lewis, that I was like aware. But I think you can turn his critiques against him as well, and I think many people have done so to say that he he's doing the same thing from the other direction, right? Yes, hmm. he is. He is as bad as Lewis, as agenda driven. Hmm. Um, where would he be without C.S. Lewis? Yeah. So in the very in the very opening of the Golden Compass, he has Lyra hide in a wardrobe um, to observe her uncle uh, give his his fascinating uh, lantern slide presentation. Um, and, and yeah, the, I'm sure there are other um, sort of direct uh, comparisons that one could make, but that's the one that I've seen people make um, pretty, pretty well, it's, frequently. it's the most obvious. Yeah. But the whole, the whole idea is uh, the rebuttal of Lewis. Yes. Who was a Christian apologist and Pullman is a Christian. Is there a is there an opposite term? Uh, a, accuser, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Accuser, that's, uh, that's good. I like that. Yeah. So, how how about the um, the comparison to a secondary world, um, which is a kind of that's great. Mm -hmm. I think that. Alternate Oxford, it works like a charm. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't like the world of the second one uh -huh. um, because it, it's hard for me to say why, and that probably is a judgment on me and not on, not on Pullman. But I felt more of a sense of of straining for an invention. Mm. trying to make a secondary world. And the yeah. first uh, with Jordan College and, and Jericho and um, the, the Egyptians and then even the North, I thought worked very well. I just felt that he ran out of steam. The, yeah, well, there's something strange going on there too because placing the city in the lights Ge geographically, that should overlap with the North in that other world, you know, based on sort of how he's constructed it. Um, but it doesn't, right? That's a kind of Mediterranean place, which is sort of inexplicably yeah. shown there. So there's a kind of a geographic problem, which is not unlike the great problems Tolkien had to fit his, his round world and his, and his um, extended uh -huh. West into the same kind of package eventually. Um, but whereas Tolkien wrestled with that for his whole life, it seems like Pullman sort of just, I'm going to sort of finesse this and make it kind of go, you know, um, which I can... I'm saying it better than I could. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. It, thank you. Well, so that's, that's an interesting way for me to, to talk about maybe the feel of the first book versus the feel of the second and third to make it sort of a, a, a kind of geographic thing and, and think about it from that direction. Um, it'll take me a while to get there. Uh, I'm just now reading, you know, kind of chapter by chapter for this project. Um, and as I go along, I'm trying to look at different sources that might have influenced Pullman, but also look at things that he's said about his own work and things that 
other writers in that fantasy tradition, um, how they would sort of be in conversation with one another. Um, right. And well, so right, primarily Tolkien and Lewis, um, because those are kind of his his uh, figures of of chagrin or or anxiety or you know he's trying to one up them in some way. Um, Pullman, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't one up Tolkien. It's it's a tall order. Yeah. That Lewis, I think he he is striving to out Lewis Lewis. Yeah. Um, but he's just as preachy, just as agenda driven. Uh, he, Lewis is saying it is. Right. And Pullman is saying, no, it isn't. And and Tolkien is saying. Oh God, where do you want to start? But, so this is kind of Tolkien your not preaching. Yeah. Tolkien doesn't have um, a moral message. He's writing a, a wonderful world with enormous mythic yeah. values to it. Um, but he's not trying to convince his reader of anything except I, that the world exists. Yeah, so in what sense, I guess this kind of comes to the end of the fairy stories essay um, where he talks about the, uh, the gospels as kind of the ultimate consummation of, of the uh, yeah. argument he's been making, right? Um, and, and I think, I think there is a serious uh, disconnect there with, with what Pullman is doing because he doesn't have a similar, he doesn't have a similar kind of anchor, I guess, once he's jettisoned the gospel stories, the Bible, as, as just another myth. Um, in its place, what, yeah, what's, what's there, what could be there in its place, I guess, if anything? Um, I don't know. That, that epilogue to On Fairy Stories is really very, very interesting. Yeah. Partly um, in terms of the physical evidence, it's written on totally different kind of paper hmm. from the rest of, of manuscript B. Much, much smaller. It's clearly uh, an addendum, uh, a sort of something tacked on to what was uh, hmm. in itself a completed essay. Yeah. And, and I've always found it interesting for that, for that reason, that there's a, there's a kind of and so that's hitched on to the fairy story essay, which would be complete without it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's maybe one of the clearer places where you get a sense of, of Tolkien landing on one side or the other of that is there isn't there sort of question yeah, yeah. Uh. which he which he very often waffles <laughs> yeah um i i guess i would make the argument and i i probably haven't read enough of pullman's um statements and things but i would try to make the argument i suppose that based on his actual myth or his story, um, just reading from within it, there's evidence that he's at least conflicted about um, his belief or his faith or, or whatever, um, at, at least in the Golden Compass. And I think also in the other two books as well, um, I'll have, that's kind of a, an underlying thread that I want to follow as I reread these. Um, to see what kinds of tension there might be between his atheist um, agenda against Lewis and whatnot versus his own, um, the way his story sort of betrays his own actual beliefs. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. I, I hope you do that, and I look forward to reading it. 
I think, I think I feel a, a sense of that too. Now, mm. to be conflicted is to be human. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tolkien was conflicted, really conflicted. At on one level, he thought this was a fallen world and nothing was ever going to turn out right. Um, and on the other, he wanted very much to believe in redemption and the promise of heaven. So you get these two uh, poles sort of warring with each other. I mean, what happens to Frodo is just awful. Yeah. Um, and the rest of Middle Earth gets a happy ending and everybody gets married and and Sam <laughs> has a lot of trees and uh, and we all live happily ever after, except the protagonist yeah. whose life is ruined. Yeah. And yeah, the ending there, I think it has it sort of resonates again with the ending of the last book of this the um his dark materials where Will and Lyra are, they return to their own separate worlds. Yes, yeah, um, so we meet as atoms and, and molecules and... They, they sort of, exactly, yeah, they, they release the dead, right? So that's part of the, the third book there um, from their, their kind of prison world um, out into, yeah, to be dis so, disintegrate essentially versus bubbles in the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the other part of it is that they, they agree to kind of live their own lives and not, not only dwell on like a nostalgia for this adventure that they've had, um, which I thought was kind of like the way in which um, Frodo is released from Middle Earth to um, to go beyond the bounds of mortality, right? Oh, um, he no, he isn't. Oh, sorry. Also, I, I hate to be so vehement, but the fact that he goes to the Undying Lands does not mean that he uh, is given eternal life. Tolkien is very clear about that. Ah. Uh, he's going to die. Just like everybody else. Uh -huh. Yeah. Tolkien says he goes there to be healed if that is possible. But healed, not resurrected. Mm -hmm. You gotta read the letters. Yeah, I've never I've never read his collected uh it's letters. Very interesting because of course people wrote to him about this. Uh there's a kind of promise held out at the end of um, the return of the king, uh, you know, with Frodo seeing the gray rain curtain roll back in the far green country and a swift sunrise. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything in terms of Frodo's eventual mortality. Hmm. Well, that sort of scuttles my my thoughts about that um, that parallel, I suppose. Um, but it's okay. And, well, go look it up for yourself. Read it. Yeah. It. Yeah. Well, I, I guess um, in terms of the uh, this this secondary world creation thing, um, that seems one point at which they uh, the two authors, Tolkien Pullman. Um, seem to be uh, comparable in some respects while diverging in others. Um, obviously, the issue of faith is another on which they can be compared but seem to diverge. Um, what about the, um, the kind of metaphysical speculations about uh, dust that... Um, oh, I was going to ask you. Yeah. What, what is the dust? Yeah, so my understanding of it is that it's a kind of it's a kind of mystery which Pullman is exploring through his story. I don't think he has one answer to that question. He certainly doesn't at the start of the books. Um, 
considerably relieved. Yeah. Thank you. That's <laughs> what I felt. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> also, one, one really interesting example of this is how at the end of the first book, Lord Azriel says that he's going to go and destroy dust and, um, and end its uh, effect on people, right? Which is original sin, whatever that is. Okay, but, but then later, if I'm remembering right, he says basically, oh, I didn't, really, I didn't really mean that. I was saying that because I thought that is what you wanted to hear. And it would, I don't know, it would seem pretty cl clear to me that Pullman had no idea what dust was at that point <laughs> and was trying to kind of rework some of what he'd already published. Yeah. Uh, I had I had very much the same feelings. Okay. <laughs> and, and let's credit let's give Pullman credit. It's, yeah. It's not easy to write theological or anti-theological fantasy and to make a coherent world. I can tell you this because I'm trying to do it, and it's bloody hard. Oh, right on. Understand how Tolkien felt when he had to bring the Hobbit into line with the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, he was stuck with what he'd already written, um, and which people accepted and believed. And then he had this other wonderful story, which was unfolding, but which was pulling him back in a sense because of the constrictions that he had already laid out. It yeah. This is, this is one area where I think that Pullman wants to be actually very much in line with what Tolkien describes in terms of the story sort of being there and you discovering it rather than actually making it all up, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I um, think so. Um, Pullman is not Tolkien. No. But who is? Yeah. Well, so that's sort of the, that's the challenge, right, of the, um, like, the Virgil to the Dante, or the, uh, or the Homer to the Virgil, right? It's like... Well, yeah, what are you going to do? I, each of them, yeah, each of them has to address that, that challenge in their own way. Um, I think that's very perceptive of you. I agree. Cool. Yeah. I see. I. I guess I'm. I'm hesitant to. Um, to compare them directly on many points, but there's some in which I think that they are. Uh, that there's some fruitful area to to look at. Um, Pullman. Pullman. Yeah. Not yeah. Homer. <laughs> no. No. Of course. Okay. okay. Uh, no. They being Tolkien and Pullman. But to. Um, to kind of yeah to come back to the dust question um one of the one of the ways in which dust develops as an idea seems to be in terms of um consciousness yes uh, it's like a kind of it's a kind of evolutionary uh idea that he has somewhere along the line human beings become self-conscious and that's like a historical point in his secondary creation Right. Um, and, and that's when dust, I that's, right. yeah. And that's, I believe that that's what he equates with what Christianity calls original sin. The fall, yes. The fall, yes. when Adam and Eve become conscious of themselves. Of their mortality, of their nakedness, yeah. Of, of just, they can see themselves. Yeah. Or they couldn't. Now, so for that, um, for that concept, uh, this is where I started reading some stuff by Barfield, which I'm, yeah. which is very new to me. But um, when I was looking at some chapters of uh, Splintered Light and some reviews of that, then I got down this rabbit hole about Barfield's writing, and he seems to be really interested in that same kind of question about. Yes. yes. Yeah. The evolution of consciousness. Very yeah. Um, and by the evolution of consciousness, I think he means self. 
consciousness, your awareness of your own awareness. Right. Yeah. Uh, and how that has to do with language also. Um, Very much. Yeah. Very much. And I think Tolkien, I think Tolkien would have agreed, did agree with Barfield. Mm -hmm. um, you can now, do another reading. I've I've been working I I've been working at um these uh these classes where the students are very self directed and so I I get to sit there and sort of look at them working and then read my own stuff while they're doing that so oh, really? um, I've been fortunate the past few uh, few weeks here um, yeah but um the the last thing I wanted to ask you about directly about Tolkien uh, sorry about Pullman, gosh, um, Pullman's idea about the demons. Um, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I love that. I think it works 100%. Of course, it is, uh, it is most overt, I think, again, in the first volume. Yeah. And I think that might be partly because he's still figuring out something about them with each new scene that he he writes yes. whereas as you say later he sort of has an idea of where he's trying to go and so tries to sort of bend the story towards it uh, i absolutely agree wesley i think you i think you're on to it which is to say you see it the way i do i i'm coming around to this yeah see i have to always fight against my you know from a kid loving these books pretty unconditionally well, sure. um, and so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a, a boondoggle here as these two things are are overlapping um, but but I suppose that that's sort of what the books are about in a way too right because it's like when you're a child your demon changes freely when you grow up your demon assumes its fixed form it's it settles as he says yeah uh, uh, and that that has to do with a, um, a, a switch of, of consciousness, right? Um, and it's irreversible. Now... Well, yeah, and I'm not sure that it is irreversible. Yeah. But he's, he's kind of boxed himself in. And so, he's, so he's stuck with... You know he's written another, another yeah. book? Have you read it? I do, yeah, I have it. I, I've read it a couple of times now. You yeah. Like I do, yeah. I think it's it's it goes in some new directions, which I think are really interesting. Um, particularly as he brings in some elements of of fairy, of fairyland. Um, yes, as they go down world. the river. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I am really curious to see where he goes with those ideas, um, where they're sort of taking him. And whether he'll do the same thing and try to sort of weave them into something, or sort of just explore where where they where they take him. Oh. Everybody is now stuck with three volumes, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which Tolkien did not write. Right, he wrote it as one big book, right? He wrote yeah. one long book, yeah. but but that trilogy format is now so ingrained in not just um, the writerly métier, but in publishing, in marketing, yeah. in sell things, um, so, that, so that you were stuck with three, a three-volume work. And, yeah. and then you have to live up to it. That, yeah, this... Unless you're... J.K. Rowling, and then you do seven. <laughs> yeah, right. She's she's kind of the other um, model, I suppose, for um, how to write these kinds of fantasy stories. Now, um, I I'm uh, also with a couple of friends of mine reading through the the Harry Potter series um, and trying to talk about them and and uh, look at them in a mythological kind of uh, mm -hmm. framework. Um, it's it's interesting how much the uh, fantasy genre, if you like, has become 
you know, something for serious study uh, over the, you know, since, since Tolkien, I guess, essentially, right? Um, I, I guess so. Uh, I know there are courses on Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, I don't think of Harry Potter as fantasy. Really? I, th I think it's about going to school. <laughs> uh, it really, it falls into uh, line with a very well accepted genre of British young adult fiction, the school novel. Yeah. And it's got all of the characteristics kindly headmaster, the friend, the nasty boy, the good teacher, the bad teacher. Um, it, it's all there. And she uses that brilliantly, I think. Yeah. But, but it the magic is sort of laid on like icing. Uh, yeah. So Pullman likes to talk about his own writing as as realism, um, and people like to tell him that no, it's obviously fantasy because there's all these fantasy elements which are right there. Um, but I I guess it's sort of a matter of. Uh, is that a black cat? It's a cat. Sorry. Yeah. This is Zoe. Hello. <laughs> yeah. How, fun. How nice. Go yeah. ahead. I mean to interrupt you. Oh, uh, sorry. No, it's um. Uh, I guess it's sort of a question of, of um, what one. For for on the one hand, like what one means by, a fantasy and realism, and how one sort of plays with those genre, constrict you know marketing and, and publishing and how that all sort of fits together. But on the other hand, it's also about whether the um, whether the author really gets to say what kind of book they've they've written once it's been written, or whether it's sort of up to the the readers to get to read it uh, freely. Well, um, now, Tolkien said it's up to the readers, and Pullman says that too. He says those words, but then he also says, "This is what I think about what I've written." So there's a, there's a bit of a do you write fiction? I I have uh, written some um, I you uh, sort of memoiristic fiction. I have a I have a hard time um, coming up with plots, so I'm not very good at. Uh... Hard. <laughs> yeah. Plots are very very difficult. Have you read um, Christopher Tolkien's The History of Middle Earth? I know it's twelve volumes. I have never had access to those books, but I oh, have listened to some of the, the courses about them on Mythgard the that Corey Olson did. Lord of the Rings uh -huh. are, are fascinating and reassuring. <laughs> I've read the whole thing over six times <laughs> before he yeah. ever got, before it ever took off. Yeah. And, and that's very reassuring. I know you also write fiction, right? Is that what you're working on primarily right now? Right now, yeah. It's a great relief from scholarship because there are no footnotes and you don't have to look up the sources and you don't have to have a bibliography. You just write. Yeah. Sometimes it's pretty lousy and then you have to write it over. Yeah. Uh, but it's very freeing. Freeing in a way, but also very constraining um, because you have to you have to stay true to what you've already written, which is yeah. what we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that process of telling stories, is that something, I suppose, um, I think that this might be something that enters into that question as well. Um, the way that one tells stories uh, as one, uh, gains experience or something in the world. Um, it's, it's really interesting that it's, uh, I think this is a, a thing that Socrates talks about in, at the very end of his um, Phaedo dialogue where he's, he's drunk the hemlock. Um, he says that he's been writing fables, I think, uh, at the end of his life there. Is that something that we sort of like, is that a, a kind of religious 
ex exploration to sort of tell stories? Um, is it oh, religious in, in what way? A uh, a kind of uh, I, I suppose when you have a mystery, um, is it a way of exploring that mystery? Um, Put like that, yes. I agree. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I, I I feel like that's yeah I feel like that's sort of the the great um, challenge of of going back and reading things um, that you loved as a child you know fairy tales um, fantasies whatever yeah uh, and it's very instructive because you get to see your young self yeah you get to see who you were. Yeah, and when you were a kid. Yeah, well, so you know, I I read The Hobbit, um, and that's how I got kind of interested in Pullman because he his book came out shortly after I'd read The Hobbit, um, and it was reviewed as something that you know, if you like that book, then you'll like this one, um, and uh, and then I got interested in from there reading the things that had influenced Pullman, right, like. Milton's poetry and Blake's uh, and the the Bible, and got interested in you know really that whole world of classical classic literature, um, but uh, it's it's still yeah it still remains to me um, so so fresh like to go back and read any of those books again I always discover new things. Um, started with some pretty good stuff. Yeah, but I guess that's, I think that's what I'm trying to say, the, the process of, of telling stories is also like, that they're somehow, um, they somehow mirror each other, right? Yeah. Reading great stories and then trying to tell your own. I agree. Uh, those processes, yeah. Uh, well, so I, I really appreciate you um, thinking through some of this with me. Uh, and and letting me know um, some great uh, ideas for further reading uh, those um, those history of Middle Earth books. I'm going to have to put uh, in an... the, the three, the four on the Lord of the Rings. Okay, I think yeah. are really useful because yeah. the false starts he made. Uh, and he was he was courageous enough to make them. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and let it roll and see where it went. And if it didn't go anywhere, then he would change it. I, so the um the other thing then the letters, right? And to look at those as well. Yeah. yeah. Um have you have you read much scholarship about Pullman's work? Or is no. that I haven't, but when I was in Oxford in June for the big Tolkien exhibit, um, I picked up a book of essays by Philip Pullman. I wish yeah. I could remember the title of it. I think I have that book, um, if it's this one, um, Demon Voices. Yes. This one. Yes. It's yeah. wonderful. It's, it's all tremendous. about writing. Yeah. Storytelling. Anyway, don't be afraid. To be corny, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, if if it doesn't work, don't be afraid to change it. It's very freeing. I I I love that book. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. So um, that would be that would be something I'm going to be reading along with as I go through the the Golden Compass again. Um, I will uh, if I ever write some. Fiction, I'll um, be sure and share it with you. Um, thank you, I'd thank like you for the encouragement. Yeah. Sure. And uh, best of luck with with your uh, fiction wrestling that you're working on there, and uh, and the scholarship that you are still doing. It's uh, it's tremendous. Well, thank you very much. Are we done? That will, I think, bring this one to an end. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Well, thank you, it's been a pleasure. How do I get out? I will 
say. Thanks again to Berlin Flieger for her generous time. And I feel like I learned a lot during that conversation. Um, in the recess period today, I have some more musical themes that I've been working on, and I will have those listed in order in the description here. Um, as far as news and updates, I do have a few new items to share. There's a NaNoWriMo group working on an idea of Corey Olson's over at the MythGuard forum. So check that out if you're still in November when you're listening to this episode. Um, feel free to chip in ideas or contribute some writing. I've also been working on lots of projects with uh, Alex Schmid and uh, Sarah Miller. And if you're interested in contributing to those, you can find out more at the History of Western Thought on Facebook and uh, find us on YouTube, search Night School. I've already done one more conversation which will accompany the next two chapters in the Golden Compass, so that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, that was with Gabriel Schenk, another preceptor at Signum University. And I should mention that that writing project over at Mythgard is being spearheaded by Sparrow Alden. Uh, really fun conversations with both of them. And so, uh, by all means, uh, keep listening, keep sending uh, comments, ideas, questions, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks again. Thank you.